It's time to join our guest this evening, who is John Barnett Patterson, and John is the Senior Supervisor for Shepley Engineers Limited. Shepley's main workshop is based in Sheffield, South Yorkshire, an area famous for its steelworks. John, welcome and many thanks for joining us tonight. Good evening, Lindsay. Good evening, everyone. So how does it feel to be working on a project for one of the most famous landmarks in, in the world? Oh, it's just a great thrill. So I've enjoyed all my time on the tower. It's been great. I've met really good people and the job's been challenging, but worth it. So yeah, it's just been such a thrill. Can you tell us a little about yourself, John, and when your interest in engineering first began? Um, probably from an early age, I was always interested in how things worked. So when I left college, I applied for a trainee metal workers position in Germany and I was based there for about four years uh, throughout Germany. After that, I worked throughout Europe and then onto the United States as well as Canada in the same field and eventually returning back to the UK. And when did you actually join Shepley Engineers? Quite a number of years ago, uh, I've probably worked for Shepley's for about six or seven years now. I did take a brief sabbatical, um, but yeah, about six or seven years, Lindsay. Now, Shepley work on a, a very wide range of projects. I know they do nuclear decontamination, then they have the restoration section. Can you tell us about the different kinds of projects that Shepley engineers work on? Well, obviously, we know we're on Parliament, so we're doing Elizabeth Tower. We have as well done the other roofs on Parliament as well, so we're very busy there. Uh, we've got Manchester Town Hall, which is a, another big project, a lot of cast iron windows and stained glass uh, involvement there. So we use uh, Renton, who have obviously done a little bit of work on the tower as well for us there. Um, uh, we recently did a bronze dome for quite a famous uh, pop star. So uh, a lot of fingers and a lot of pies. You can't tell us which pop star that was. No. no. Okay, <laughs> thought I'd just try there. Okay, so um, which parts of the Elizabeth Tower is, is Shepley actually restoring? So if you go to your first slide, I don't know whether we've got that, but you'll notice the, the, the roof on there. So all that gray area, the tiled area, you will see, and that's everything we did there, as well as the inside. Anything gold as well, we've changed that and that's been gilded. So everything you see there, we've pretty much done. OK, I'm not sure if this. Oh, here we go. Right. Yep. So now we're looking in this this one for um, for these are the tiles, aren't they? The, um, yeah. the tiles. this is a good one to cover the process as well. Um, I don't um, if we flick back to the other one, if that's possible. Um, you'll notice on that shot, so that's the tiles and the guys and girls there are removing the tiles very carefully and you'll notice they're all tagged up and yeah. that's very important. Everything we do must be tagged up. Um, we get an architectural drawing. Uh, we'll copy the tags from the drawing onto the tiles and then we'll take photographs of the entire area upload that to our Zootech software before we remove anything. And that software we'll then use again when we start removing. And I'll take a photograph front and back of the item, check for any faults on the item and any drill holes that we might need to make fixings. Uh, we'll copy everything into that software. So my tablet, I would just put in all this information. So Zootech is like a, a construction sort of software. Exactly, Lindsay. Um, right. you know, it's very efficient. Um, do you want me to describe the whole process onto Sheffield? And uh, that would be really good, actually, if, if we could almost like take the journey, just one of those tiles and take its journey from literally being removed from the roof of the Elizabeth Tower all the way up to Sheffield. Yeah, so obviously I've removed the tile. We've got the information about that tile. We package it up very carefully and that's then shipped off to Sheffield. They'll unload it. It'll go straight to a bench. Uh, they will then inspect it roughly and then it will be blasted. The reason why we're going straight to blasting is because we can check the tile for any damage. I won't get all the damage on the tile. It could be superficial cracking. 
uh, there could be major cracking that the paint is actually covering. So once you take that paint off, uh, we'll discover how good the tile is. If it needs recasting, then it'll be off to Hargreaves or Ballantines in Scotland. Hargreaves is based in Halifax and we'll do a recast there. Um, but hopefully we don't have to do that. The tile itself would be repaired if it needed any repairs and then it will be pushed on to the paint shop. It'll be sprayed. We do three coats, three special coats will go on the tile. It will be set aside for drying and then it'll be packed up and shipped back to the Elizabeth Tower. So the only bit of the process then that you're not doing there is the actual casting of the, of the iron for new pieces, but you're basically removing it, taking it to Sheffield, then it goes to the iron foundries in, in Halifax and, and Scotland, and then it comes back to, to you and, and you reinstall it in the tower. Exactly, Lindsay. Preferably, we, we don't really want to cast anything if we can help it, but uh, unfortunately, that's not always the case. Yeah. OK, let's take a look at the next slide. Right, so here we have our team and they're removing what's called a coverall. That one looks like it's broken, um, but they're just drilling out the fixing that holds the coveralls on, which holds that tile on. So they're carefully drilling that off and we'll remove all these coveralls and then we'll start looking at tile removal from there. Again, everything nicely tagged. Uh, this is uh, pre-COVID, so that's why they're not wearing <laughs> yeah. masks. So right, yeah. I'll just say that now. <laughs> Uh, so yeah. this was a few years ago What's and here's a yeah so Lindsay this is a great example of what we're doing on the zoo tech so you can see all these lovely colored dots that's what I've done there just to indicate what problems we've got or not necessarily problems but just to highlight what holes we're going to reuse I'll also identify what kind of fixings were in there and we'll reevaluate what new fixings we're going to use. Obviously, we can't use the old ones. Uh, we'll we'll reorder uh, some nice new ones. So this tagging process is very essential and it just helps the workshop identify what they're going to do there. And have the gutters been very badly damaged? I remember there was one that was completely broken and that was a little bit nervy trying to get that one out. I had to do it. I had to remove it out of order. Normally we'll follow a specific uh, way of removing, but this particular one, I had to do it a different way. So that was very, very tricky um, and it was dangerous, but obviously we do everything safely and uh, it was a safe removal in the end. How many people, though, does it take to, to, to literally lift it off and get, and get it down? If I remember, I think I used about four, four in a team. And during the lifting process, I'd really team it up. So I'd double that number, no problem, just to make sure everything's done safely. It's a long way. You know, if you're on the wrong side of the building, it's got to travel quite a long way. The footprint of the building is very small. Uh, we need scaffold adaptions. Uh, we've got to re-sling it onto different uh, monorails just to get it round. So a very tricky operation, but uh, very pleased that went very, very well. So you didn't so, drop any? No, <laughs> no. no. Well, they're 650 kg. Uh, that's a lot to drop. Yeah. Uh, so they're very, very weighty items and uh, it was cause for celebration when they were out and then <laughs> coming back, it was another cause for celebration to have them all fitted. So uh, yeah. very relieved about that, Lindsay. Good. OK. Uh, so here we have one of our gutters there and that's partially removed there. Uh, yeah. She's all nice and safe, got that well strapped. Again, the weight was always an issue and the space, the footprint of the job was always a major challenge. Yeah, uh, but uh, oh, yeah, we've just slipped there. <laughs> so this is our blasting. Uh, what we're doing in the workshop here is blasting all this, all these iron tiles, all our iron objects, get all that old paint off. Now the paint itself contains lead, so you want to be nice and protected. As you can see, this guy here, he's got all the protection you need, and he's just blasting all that, all that paint off and ready for the paint shop or a viewing before paint shop to see if we've got any cracks in there. Now I can see those particles are coming out full throttle and, and I know they have to be abrasive to, to, to clean the surface. So what kind of particles do you use to get all the, the rust and stuff off? 
I'm not so sure in the workshop, but I know it, on the tower we used a copper shot, um, you know, and, and the guys really, they've got a lot of tidying up to do after that. They've got to sweep all that up and try and reuse some of the shots. So it's quite a tough job that they have. So on Elizabeth Tower as well, you know about the space there and everything. It was very tough for them. Yeah. And here's our chap in the spray department. So he's spraying everything. And once again, we'll go for those three coats to make sure everything's lovely. Uh, again, fully protected, fully protected. So, um, you know, again, everything nice and safe. But how long will he be in there spraying, John, before he has to come out for a breather? Um, I mean, we'll just go on an object basis. So once one object's done, he'll come out. I mean, you know, it's not absolutely even with uh, iron in there. You know, you'll have one or two items in there and spray those. Right. Yeah. Right. So here we have the skeleton of the building. So we've got all our tiles off and now we can see what's wrong here. Um, now, you'll probably see all these horizontal beams. You've got the main skeleton there going up, but these horizontal beams are called purlings. And on the south especially, we had a lot of issues there. Uh, it suffered, the tower suffered bomb damage and on that south side in particular, we had uh, a lot of cracks and things like that. So what we had to do was install temporary works to remove these. And temporary works, really, that gives us that option to remove it safely. We'll put a support in, uh, leave that in till we remove the item and the item comes back either recast or repaired. We've probably got an image of that as well, Lindsay, I think. Uh, okay. What's this that? is a good image of just a little bit of damage, Lindsay. So you can see there the lug's gone. This is a slightly easier repair. We just plate that uh, and that would be good. But that's a good image of, of what can happen there. That's completely blown. Um, there would have been a bolt through there. That bolt's been removed and that lug was really doing nothing. So um, that had to be repaired. Uh, if we flip to the next one, and this is an image of the temporary works here. And you can see that it's highlighted in the green. Just above that, you can see where the original purling was. So we've removed that purling. We leave that temporary works there till the purling comes back and gets reinstalled. And then we can think about removing everything. Yeah. But very important. Okay. And this is another good example of temporary work. So here we see the bottom of the spiral stair. Now the spiral stair links up the belfry to the Ayrton light. And our team there, the, the near the bottom there, they've removed the crux of the stair. And this is all done with temporary work. So we're removing the hand drill, which you can probably just see the remnants of that at the bottom. And we're yeah. inserting long threaded bar to keep the steps clamped together while we remove them with our um, jigs and, and hoists and things. So everything done very safely. And once again, it's uh, it's pre-COVID. Yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it's a nice shot, this one, it's isn't lovely. it? So, yeah, the uh, that's thing. Ian and myself, I believe. So we teamed up with Clock Team for the removal of the hands. And uh, that was very interesting to work with clock team. They had a special device to remove the hand and we helped them uh, just to sling up the hands and get them around the building safely. So that was a good team effort on Parliament. And now we're back in the, the clock face here. We've got the clock face uh, framework, the cast iron framework. Yes, there's a couple of nice pictures here. So everyone will know instantly what these are. Um, there's the clock dial there. Now, what problem we had here was when we blasted it all, we found all these pinholes. And um, you'd probably just assume that's nothing and we'll just put a bit of filler in there. But closer inspection, there was a good amount of rust inside the pinhole and a larger cavity, just where the casting originally hasn't flowed into the mould enough, so it was hollowed out. Uh, and unfortunately, we need to make the pinhole bigger to be able to get this cavity. So almost like a bit of dental work, really. And uh, we opened up all these holes and you can see how you can see the rust in there. Yeah. It's, it's all in there and that needed to be removed, painted and then filled and painted again. 
and the clock face is incredibly narrow space there. I mean, you can't walk two abreast, you have to walk. It's it's so narrow. So that must have been quite tricky to, to have been doing all this major works in such a, a narrow space. It was. It's a lot of up and down on the scaffolding. Uh, how the blasting guys uh, did it, I don't know, um, because <laughs> I mean, we had quite a number of times the fire alarms would go off just because of the blasting, you know, so a number of times we've all had to walk down to the bottom yeah. um, because of the blasting, but it really was a tough job for them, uh, but they did a good job. Right, so here we have our quarter bell hammers. So we were tasked with the removal of just the quarter bell hammers. And you can see there we've got this uh, wrapped very, very well here. And the main reason was uh, we didn't want any damage to the bells. We don't want to injure ourselves. So we heavily strapped this uh, hammer arm so we could just cradle that back once we'd unloosened all the bolts. Um, so, you know, th that was a, a really nice little job there. And then that went to the Sheffield workshop. Exactly right. Yep. Sheffield, get a bit of blasting paint, just check for any necessary repairs. I don't think anything needed to be recast on that. So uh, that's relatively straightforward, that one. Good. And here we are, uh, that's it all packaged up there. And um, we had to put a lot of markings, a lot of indicators on there just to remind ourselves which way these things went back on. But again, we wouldn't be refitting these clock team wood. Uh, they're the specialists, um, but you know, we, we tagged them up as best we could to help them. Yeah. Right, so now we're putting things back. So it's all looking lovely here. We've got a nice row of tiles in there. There's Alex there. So, um, the main issues we had with the tiles were at the very bottom, we had to recast all of these low level tiles. Now, as I've, I may have briefly touched on, recasting is great, but we don't want to recast if we can help it. Unfortunately, all those raw ones we had to recast. So that means we're changing things slightly. We'll never get things exactly right. So in a way, it doesn't help us that much. And I believe it was probably about row three before we were up and running and, and safe to say we've got it um, to where we like it. But uh, we did a really good job there. That was quite challenging. Setting those low level tiles was very, very tough. Um, on the right, you can see finial installation going on. And what's happened Originally, the finials weren't straight. Uh, it might surprise a lot of people. They, were they weren't straight. Yeah, so you could probably walk down the street and you'd probably, if you'd looked up, you'd have probably seen that the, the, these things aren't straight. So, what we did when they came back, we made these finials straight. Now, that's all well and good, but then there's a knock on effect because we've changed something. Uh, and that just meant that putting the tiles back was, was even tougher. Um, and as well, it's row one. We've got all those problems with the new tiles. Uh, so that was a little bit of a difficult area, but the end result was spectacular. So we were very happy with that in the end. Good. And yeah, this is a good shot. So at the end, every time we'd remove an item and it was the last item, and every time we'd refit an item and it was the last item, we'd have a little bit of a celebration, a few photos. This is one of them because this is the last heavy dormer. And these dormers are quite heavy, they're about 100 kg. That is um, in two sections. So what you see in there is the window part, it's actually a roof part for that, and that's even heavier. Yeah. Um, and, and they were very tricky, not only the weight, but it's just you've got to be so gentle with these things or you're going to scratch tiles, um, everything like that. So you have to be so careful. So it's kind of like you're putting all this rigging on for heavy duty stuff and then you've got to have a really deft touch to fit it. So um, but in the end, that went very well. You see a lot of happy faces there. So. And presumably, John, all your team have got a head for heights as well because you have to when you're up there. Um, I think because the view is so nice, <laughs> I don't think anyone worried about it really. Good. Uh, it's such a nice view. So um, I can't remember, I can only remember one visitor who um, he really didn't like it up there. And I think he went down. I uh, just had to hold his arm and get him down. So yeah, heights aren't for everybody. And it did move. It used to back in the day when we had the scaffold fully up to the top, it did move quite a, quite a bit in the wind. Wow. Right, um, so, quite exciting. 
But yeah, so that's the dormers. And I think there was about 56 of these, Lindsay. And as you go up, they get smaller. Yeah. Um, and, you know, by the time you're at the top, uh, the smallest one, you could probably fit with just one person and put it on. So uh, they weren't all as big as this. So they're like decorative windows on, on the roof as, as we're going up to the Yeah, top. they look lovely. Uh, they do look nice with all the gilding on, they look lovely. Yeah. Right, so here's the bottom of, this is the base of the spire. And our guys just making things uh, good here because we're going to be putting the actual lightning rod through there. And I think if I remember that came in about three sections and I think they're about two and a half to three metres long each section. Uh, so he's just making sure everything's correct there from when we start pulling it through. Uh, so that actually went together quite well, uh, but we planned that out and, and that went quite well as well. So that was another good effort. The base we had to make sure was absolutely level. What we didn't want was the spire uh, and the lightning rod looking uh, not straight, so to speak, as it's the main focal point. So. Yeah. Um, we had to spend a bit of time on the base just getting that right. So again, uh, good work there. Back to the spiral staircase. Yeah, well, this one's the lower staircase, uh, Lindsay. So um, this is the belfry stair, which links up to the spiral. So you're technically right. Um, now, again, I mentioned the casting. So on the left, you can see what's called a stringer. Uh, there's three sections shown there. You can just about see the third section. There's four in total, but the fourth piece was only about 300 millimetres long, and that was the only stringer we didn't recast. The other three we had to recast. Um, again, that causes its own little problems because we've changed something. We've had to make something new, and we won't get it as perfect as the original. Um, and on this one, it was a little bit of a battle, but to be honest, the end result was was really spectacular. It looks absolutely, we haven't got a finished shot there, but on the shot on the right hand side, you can see our temporary works in there. Yeah. You can see, hopefully, our threaded bar bolts going through, and that's how we stack these steps. They'll be fixed on the right hand side to the stringer and bolted in by the threaded bars until I put the handrail in on the left hand side. Yeah. So here we have a bronze window. Now we have quite a, a number of these. I don't know the total number off the top of my head, but you can see it's all nice and shiny there. That's not what we want. Uh, we want a sort of dark brown effect. So we have to patinate these windows and we use a kind of acid for that. And it just discolors the metal slightly. And we need to apply about five or six coats to that to get it right. Uh, so um, as well as the workshop would have handled all the repairs on there, the hinges were quite bad mm. um, and uh, a lot of repairs needed, a lot of repairs. Oh, and now we're back <laughs> to the air and light. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, looking a bit sorry for itself there. Yeah, I'm glad to see it looks a lot better now, Lindsay, but uh, yeah. yeah, so. Um, Is that mainly water damage up there? Well, when a few years back we discovered the time capsule. Oh, yes. And yeah. uh, that was great. And uh, we went to the archives and then we read through the documents in there. And they mentioned the Ayrton Light in particular. A lot of pigeon damage. Um, you can probably just see there's mesh at the back of this. And that was put in in the 50s there to stop the pigeons coming in and causing damage to the Ayrton Light and other things. Um, obviously, there's a lot of water damage as well. The tower is open to the elements. Not a lot of people kind of think of that, but it is open to the elements. So you get all the water ingress, everything like that. So it, it was very badly damaged. Yeah, very yeah. badly damaged. And um, yeah, so this is us doing the strip. So we've taken away the roof, the glass, and you're now into the lower base. You can see in the center, that's the gas pipe, the old gas pipe. Um, and obviously we don't use that now. It's all going to be LED, I think, Lindsay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that was that did have its own problems. The scaffolding in there was very busy, as the term I like to use, and so room in there was was quite limited. When we stripped that, we still had the scaffold going all the way to the spire, so there was a lot of scaffolding support in that area, and it was very tight for room. 
and that's us uh, just building the Ayrton light. So what's happened is we've stripped the Ayrton light. It's gone to Sheffield. Sheffield decided to do a mock up. There were so many bits that didn't work anymore due to the damage that it was the best position was just to rebuild it in the workshop and then send it back to us. So almost like an Airfix kit, it came back and it went together really well. Uh, so that was a that was a big bonus there. And you can just see the various stages. There's the mullion brackets going up and here we've got all the panels and uh, it's looking quite nice there. Yeah. Also, these decorations on there, they were removed as well, the gold ones. So uh, that was a job in itself. And there we have the finished Ayrton light. Beautiful. Uh, that looks very, very nice. And you can see the holes there, that was for venting the gas. It's also got a, a chimney um, and that was completely redone. We, we used new components on that as well, Lindsay. Yeah. So lots of, uh, lots um, of things. And we look forward to the LED lights going into that and to that being switched on eventually at, at <laughs> some point in the future. That that will be really lovely. There, there's a lot of quite tricky stuff here, John. What what would you say has been your most challenging uh, moment in the tower? Um, I think probably the footprint of the job was always our biggest issue. And, and not only that, in terms of um, getting the 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 materials you need it had to be then fitted straight away because we didn't have much space on the tower to store things so everything was always a bit of a rush it's got to get delivered we've got to get it up there we've got to fit it um so that was quite a challenging aspect um the gutters um yeah i guess challenging but once you've done a few you know it's going like a swiss watch so it was all right. The biggest problem there is don't be complacent, which we never were, fortunately. Yeah. Um, and other things like the delicate decorations, you just go from one extreme to another. You've got to be really delicate in parts and then really tough in other parts, like removing items and things like that. So, um, yeah, uh, I'd say that's the, the biggest challenge is uh, those two things, really. And have there been any new um, sort of processes that Shepley has developed as, as a result of working in the tower? Uh, I'd probably say, Lindsay, probably the zoo tech was great and I really enjoyed Sorry. using that. Um, we, before we used to use paper records and uh, it just it, literally you would have to draw sometimes the item on the paper. Uh, now that would have been absolutely no use on the tower because as you know it blows a gale. Um, <laughs> It'd just be off sorry. across the yeah, tent. Yeah, so I mean, it would have just been a nightmare. Uh, so luckily we got the Sutex software, the tablet. I think Parliament actually requested that to be used, but I could be wrong. Um, and the tablet was just great. Just take a picture, type in what you need to type in and upload it to the PC, which gets uploaded to Zootex. So that was that was really good. Now up in the Sheffield workshop, I understand as well that you've got some young apprentices, so the skills are being passed on, so hopefully they're not going to be lost and, and, and it will keep going. No, definitely not. Shepley's always make sure they've got new talent coming through. So um, I think there's actually one currently on Elizabeth Tower. Uh, so they've sent a young guy down here just for some experience. So um, it's still going on. There's still people coming through. Brilliant. And um, just before we move to our audience questions, John, what what has been the highlight for you of working in the Elizabeth Tower? Uh, it's been a few and uh, I'll probably say finding the time capsule was great. That was great. So Adrian and I found that. So that was a good moment for us. And we got a nice photo of that. So it, it was lovely. Did you um, know what, what it was or did you just come upon it by complete surprise? Yeah, well, um, I was in touch with Amanda, the tower coordinator, so we knew about the time capsule. We just didn't know its location. We had a rough guess where it might be. Uh, it wasn't there. Um, luckily, we found it and uh, it was really interesting. So Amanda took me to the uh, the archive and we had a good look in there and uh, some old coins and uh, a lot of literature, all the names of the people who worked there, which was very interesting, all it was written up so well, uh, sort of calligraphy on it was was lovely. So it was a sight to behold. Um, but yeah, it was very, very interesting. And it was in good condition. It was dry and everything. 
Yeah, well, it's funny. Inside, they were mentioning all these new types of plastics they were using. I think they actually used this new type of plastic to put it all in. So, uh, yeah, so it was very well sealed. So there was no problem with that. They could have probably put it on the outside. It would have been all right. So uh, yeah. perish the sword. <laughs> but that's lovely because that's a nice historic uh, artifact for, for yes. everyone to, you know, to see. So that was that was one of the highlights of um, your time there in the town. Yeah, I mean, every time we took an item out and completed a section, that was also a highlight, you know, because it was always cause for celebration, as I mentioned before. So uh, we all had a big cheer and a photo. Um, so it, it was nice. And some champagne? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> not, up, not up in the tower. Uh, yeah, pretty, no pretty wise, really. No champagne, unfortunately, I wish. OK, well, let's take a look and see now if we've got any questions coming in from our audience. And I'm just going to scroll down and have a look. So we've got Paul. Hi, Paul from Brentwood. Uh, will old pennies still be needed to adjust the speed of the clock in the 21st century? That is so funny because, Paul, uh, I was only speaking to Ian, the, the, who actually is part of clock team. And I mentioned these pennies and he said, yes, it's all coming back and we still need them. So rest assured, the clock is going to work. It's tradition, <laughs> got to have our pennies. Um, Isabel says, I was wondering whether the engineers encountered anything they didn't expect from the tower, like deeper damage or surprising elements like the original painting on the clock already mentioned. Thanks in advance. Um, there was always a bit of surprise. Um, obviously, the architects go ahead and they draw things out. Sometimes everything they draw out may not be fact, um, but you know, it's very hard to get in these areas, so you don't actually know till they're actually in there. So there was always surprises on um, the way things went together. Um, definitely, you know, that would happen on a regular basis, definitely. Um, whites as well. Uh, I remember the removal of the large uh, minute hand uh, that was a lot lighter than we envisaged so that was quite welcome to be honest um, uh, just little things like that but they matter yeah now we've got Sylvie here thanks to Mr Barnett we know how the iron steel parts were renovated that's fantastic work but was there any restoration made to the basis of the building ah was there any erosion to the stone and sand base of the building Oh, there's been a lot of damage to that and um, DBR, the contractor, they're in charge of that. So they've been sculpting, they've been replacing, uh, they've been on that tower solid. Uh, so a real good group of guys and girls and they've done a fantastic job. And they've actually got a workshop there at the base of the tower, a stonemasonry <laughs> workshop where they Yeah, you can go down there, you'll, you'll actually hear them tap tapping. So even if you walked across the bridge, you'd probably hear that tap, 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 and that's them <laughs> carving the uh, the stone. So they work on the outside as well as on the inside in the workshop. So um, yeah. yeah, you'll hear them hard at it. And I understand it's Cadeby stone from Doncaster that's being used because they've run out of Anston stone and we're not using Clipsham stone anymore. So now we're on to Cadeby stone. Yeah, I think it was quarried out. I'm not an expert on that, but when you get DBR to speak, they'll certainly inform you. They'll, they'll tell us all about it. Um, OK, another question here, John. If everything is blasted immediately, do you lose? Ah, do you lose any of the tags for putting them back? It has happened, um, but we always get around it. So it doesn't happen often, to be honest. Um, it has happened on occasion, but because we do such extensive records, we kind of know uh, that something isn't right. And we often we know what sort of happened. So on that basis, it's very rare. I can't say that it hasn't happened. Yes, it has, but very, very rarely. Good. And a question here from Pink. How long will this refurbishment be expected to last? before needing to be done again? <laughs> Not in my lifetime, I hope. <laughs> um, well, the last one, Pink, was the last major one was in the 1980s. There was also a huge one in the 1950s. So maybe another 30 odd years, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, well, I remember as a kid seeing it all scaffolded out because we actually I came to London with my parents. Actually, it was all scaffolded out in the 80s. So I was a bit disappointed because I couldn't see it. But, um, you know, it's kind of bizarre. Now I'm working on it, again, uh, you know, with the scaffolding up again. So a bit bizarre. But uh, yeah. yeah. 
and and we we had lots of people when the scaffolding started going up in 2017 wandering around saying you know where's big ben so they they <laughs> obviously also uh, a little bit uh, disappointed um yes. denise has a question denise. did you uh denise did you leave anything ah that's this nice one did you leave anything behind to let future restorers know uh you had been there we did um we've had a little bit of input there i think we put something in with the time capsule when we put it back um we didn't put it in with the time capsule but a couple of little items which i can't disclose um did go in so yes but i can't tell you what it was right so in 30 years time or 40 they'll they'll yeah, open yeah. that up that's longer than that lindsay okay <laughs> <laughs> that right um okay and david david Blythe, what was the most difficult aspect of the project uh well again i'll probably just touch on the actual footprint of the job it was just it so tight uh, square. yeah i mean you'd have to go up there to realize how tight it actually is um space to get in to do things was very very limited and really was quite a struggle and probably especially around the Ayrton light area that midsection was was very heavily scaffolded out and we had a lot of items to remove around there large decorations and things like that and uh you know the room was was a real issue but you know we managed we did manage and what about the weather because you're, you're up there in the belfry and i i know that it, you know it's very icy especially in the winter it, it can really chill to the bone the first winter was really awful um and uh you know gusting winds we had really low temperatures uh, we had snow i think it was in march um so that first year was quite tough um and i think that followed a burning hot summer uh, which was the relief, but um, yeah, the weather was uh, quite intense because you're removing the tiles, you're opening up the face, uh, a low part of the area were covered, higher up was covered, say um, the smaller roof, the lower roof wasn't, so we had that wind gusting through, uh, it was very tough conditions that first year. Yeah, um, Nikki says, are the tiles from the original 19th century build, where were the tiles cast and by whom? Um, I think a lot of them were cast across the river. Um, now, different casting companies were used on this and not the same one. You've got to bear in mind that at that time, uh, casting was quite big. So you had lots of different casting companies um, uh, along the river um i can't remember one of the name i think it was jazabel or or something he actually cast the main Jabez james and yes John Jay. well done then, Lindsay. Yeah. he actually cast the main yeah. structure beams uh now whether or not he did the tiles i don't think so there's no kind of markings on the tile to make me aware of that but we would have they would have used a lot of casting companies back in the day and um pink again um hi john were there any any unexpected surprises? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, uh, probably when I think probably on the lower uh, to you guys and girls, it, it won't be a big thing, but probably when I removed the stringer for the lower belfry stairs, I didn't expect that to be broken. And that had a crack right against the wall which you couldn't see till you'd removed it. And that was a bit of a surprise and it was a bit of a letdown because obviously I knew we're gonna to have to recast that, we can't repair that. Uh, so that was disappointing and a bit of a surprise. Uh, but yeah, that's probably probably one of those. And two more questions from um, uh, Pink. Um, oh no, one more, sorry. Pink says, to, oh, well, we've covered this a little bit, Pink. Tell us about the time capsule. So you, you've told us a little bit about what you found there and how did it feel to actually take it out and hold it? Um, it was great. So um, I'd been for numerous times, just been with a, a little endoscope camera, just looking for it because I knew roughly the location because Ian from Clock Team had told me, Amanda, tower coordinator, also told me as well. Um, we had a rough idea, but no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't find it with this endoscope. Uh, and it was almost like it's not there. Um, and then I think I was just tasked to remove a bit of paneling um, from the lower spire. 
and uh, we could see it. It was just down below us on the metalwork in a lovely wooden box. Uh, and instantly we knew, well, that's it, you know, so that was a great moment. Um, and obviously we we got down inside, uh, we pulled it out and uh, we took a lovely photo. This is it. We've got it. We informed Amanda, the tower coordinator. So it was a lot of joy. Um, and when we opened it, went to the archives, they'd already opened it, but it was all laid out there. Uh, and like I say, it was very, very interesting. They'd spent a bit of time on it. And, and just informed us of new plastics that had came out in the 50s. Um, we had the coins in there and we had the lovely list of names of all the people who who worked on the project. So uh, it was very interesting. And the next question, are you leaving your own time capsule? And you've given us an inkling that there that, that yeah. will be some, <laughs> some, something. That I know you're, you can't say exactly what, but maybe it might be nice to do all the names of, of every single person that's been working on, on the project in the tower over the past, you know. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. I'm not fully versed on, on what actually Parliament left in the new time capsule, but uh, hopefully it is something like that. But uh, we'll wait and see. Right. Um, then we've got Dave. Amazing work. What prompted you to consider that the dials were originally a different colour? Was it before the restoration or was it as you were up the tower? Also, were there any old coloured photos of the tower with this original colour? Uh, uh, right. Uh, so, Lindsay, you'd already touched on this at the start. So you said they painstakingly taken paint samples and yep. discovered the colour. So that was how that was discovered. They removed some of the paint and discovered Prussian blue, was it? Stunning uh, Prussian blue, blue yeah. Yes, that's right. So they discovered it that way. Yes. Um, no, there's no real folk because obviously everything was black and white then. So uh, you're struggling to find the actual colours there. Um, so I believe it was just done through research. So we do have photos of the hands and things like that. There is even some photos of the hands removed in probably the 19. It looked like the 19 early, early 30s, 20s, something like that. But obviously black and white is so all no colour. But there is one watercolour. Well, there might be several actually by Charles Barry, the original um, architect with Pugin. And Barry had done a watercolour and in that watercolour, the, the the hands and the and the clock face was blue, so it it was always fantastic. You know um, more than me, the, Lindsay, on the, that. The, ori the original, but in the 1930s, I suppose as well because of the the grime and the pollution in London, they just painted it black, black. And I gold, would say that's and, correct. And that's what we've had ever since. So I think it's going to be quite quite a surprise. Um, lovely in the sunshine, you know, in the summer when we see these these gorgeous uh, blue. And the and the white pot opal glass as well, uh, which is hand blown, is just stunning. It's gorgeous, it really, really gorgeous. Beautiful. Right, let's see if we've got any more questions. Nikki, what work have you got left to do? Um, I'm pretty much finished. So, <laughs> um, I think what we've got left to do is mainly just probably little additions here and there, but the crux of our work is done. So, um, and the the stonemasons, they're really down quite far. They're near the bottom. So, you know, the project is drawing to a close, definitely. And clock team just got to put the parts back. And I think that starts uh, this week or next week, I think, Lindsay. So it's all it's all starting to come together. But that it scaffolding is. took 13 months to go up. And I think if I'm right in saying it weighs about 162 elephants. So it's, it's, it's going to take quite a bit of time to come back down again, isn't it? It, surprisingly, taking it down goes quite quickly. Um, so the, I think the scaffolders enjoy taking it down more than they do putting it up. Um, so we'll see. But yeah, normally it does come down quite quickly. Right. But we'll okay. see on that one. Next week, we've got um, the Ballantines of Scotland uh, um, chap coming there, the Iron Foundry, one of the foundries, because you, you, as we mentioned earlier, John, you subcontract the uh, the casting of the iron to two foundries, one in Halifax and, and one in, in Scotland. So they'll be saying a little bit about um, what they do. Um, yeah, that'll be very interesting. Do you, have you worked with them on other projects? The, uh, the the Personally, I haven't, no, um, just really Parliament. But, um, you know, uh, Shepley's certainly put work there where, when, where they've got it elsewhere. They, they do have a lot of projects. So. Yeah, 
Okay, we've got Sylvie and Isabel. So um, Isabel says, is it possible to work up there when there's a storm or heavy rain? Um, we've been winded off a few times, so uh, heavy rain, uh, we probably, depending on where you were, you'd probably go inside. Um, but certainly wind, yeah, that's a no go once it reaches a certain limit. Uh, uh, so, yeah, it's um, it's not a good place to be up there. Like I say, in a strong wind, the scaffold does move. Not so much now because we've lost so much of that scaffolding. But yeah, yeah it's not it's a good place to be right, when it's windy. Right down now so that we can see those those beautiful clock faces. And our final question of the evening, Sylvie says, what are the different craftsmen working on the restoration of the Elizabeth Tower? Sorry, Lindsay, what? Um, which are the different crafts that are being worked on? So so we've got the iron and, and then we've got the gilding and, and you mentioned earlier the stonework. And, That's um, right. So you've got sculptors, you've got gilders. Um, you know, there's there's such a, a large range of skill sets on this project, which is, uh, you know, a sight to behold, seeing them all work, especially the sculpting. It's quite incredible, really. Lovely. Well, um, that brings us pretty much to um, a close. So I'd just like to say um, thank you to all our team behind the scenes, our producers, Sam and Isabel and my colleague David. And thank you so much, John, uh, for joining <laughs> us you. this evening and telling us all about the cast iron restoration at Shepley's. It's, it's been a real, uh, you know, really just amazing to see just how much work, the intricate and very complex work that's going on up there. Yeah, um, I'm glad uh, to put it out there. So I've really enjoyed tonight. So thank you very much. It's, it's our pleasure. So, so good night, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you all again at future talks. Thank you. <laughs>